My name is Tori, and I'm so glad that you're joining another virtual bird walk hosted by Chirp Nature Center. Bird Talk. There we go. I'm glad that you're joining a bird talk today. <laughs> this is Chirp's third year of holding educational wild bird related events. They run from May through October, so we're getting towards the end of our season. But you can enjoy all of our virtual events online on our YouTube channel anytime. So we would like to go through a few birdhouse rules before we begin our bird talk today. First off, go ahead and post in the chat where you're coming from and what your favorite corvid is, if you have one, <laughs> because we love to interact with you throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions for our presenter, you can post them in the chat. We're going to have an extensive Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so we'll be sure to address those then. But go ahead and tell us, like, this is great or that's so interesting. Again, it's so fun to be able to produce live events and have you engaging the entire time. Also make sure that you pay attention because at the end of the presentation, I'll be filling you in on how what you can do to be entered in to win a very special Corvid related bird themed prize and how you can win free prizes along the way. So don't forget to pay attention and have a lot of fun. And let's go ahead and get started. I want to introduce you to our guest speaker for today. His name is Dr. McCormack, and he is the director of the Moore Laboratory of Zoology at Occidental College. He's also the curator, well, it means he is the curator of 62,776 bird specimens in his museum. He is also a published researcher and an associate professor, and is passionate about understanding the evolutionary history of birds and impacts of current environmental changes has led him to extensive research on the wild birds in Mexico. And in his free time, he likes to spend time with his kids who are six and 12 years old. They love playing soccer and they're pretty much obsessed. This is actually a picture of him and his family. They went and watched the U.S. Women's World Cup team win in France. So not only is he a very educated man, but he also has a lot of fun hobbies too. So I hope you're ready to meet Mr. or Dr. McCormack. You can go ahead and Turn on your camera and unmute yourself, and we'd love to see you. Hello, how are you doing Hi. today? <laughs> Good, thank you so much for that great introduction. You're welcome. Um, well, we're so glad to be here. I'm so glad. Okay, so I wanted the audience to get to know you a little bit better, but what was your aha moment when you were studying birds? Well, um, I'll show you a picture of one of the first slides we come to when I share my presentation, but um, the very first field job I ever got working on birds was working on corvids. I was oh, wow. an undergraduate at University of Arizona, just kind of searching for what my major was going to be. What was I going to do with my life? Like a lot of college students. And I was taking an ecology course and a professor suggested that I go to a place in Arizona to study jays um, for a couple professors. So once I got out there and just, you know, saw that being in nature and, you know, you, you could do that, you could study birds and someone would actually pay you for it. Um, I'd say that was my aha moment. That makes sense. And so how many years have you been studying birds? Um, so over 20 years now, that was in 1997. So it's been a, a wild ride ever since. Wow, that's awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to this and I know our guests are as well. So let's jump into this clever Corvid presentation. Great, let me just share my screen here. Yeah, well, thank you again, everybody for, for tuning in. Um, that was a great introduction. Uh, and and uh, just to sort of reiter reiterate a little bit of what I do at Occidental College. Um, I'm a professor, so that means I teach. I teach avian biology and also evolutionary biology, which is what I'm teaching right now. And I carry out research studies, mostly on birds, including many corvids. And then, um, as was mentioned, I'm also the curator of the largest Mexican bird collection in the world. I don't um, get into that much here in this talk, but a good jumping off point, if you're interested in what that means and what we do with it, uh, would be through our Instagram at MLZBirds. <clears throat> so um, that's me. <laughs> up a tree. It's kind of one of those, you're probably wondering how I got here moments. Uh, this was that first field job I just mentioned. Um, I was an undergraduate, had no idea what I was doing or what I would eventually be doing. 
but I knew that this job sounded pretty cool to spend a summer in nature studying birds uh, with a couple, Esther and Jerry Brown, who were professors that had been studying Mexican jays in Arizona for quite a long time. And uh, my job was basically to find their nests and when they were young nestlings, uh, to put small color bands on their legs so that when they grew up, we would be able to identify them by the, uh, to individual by the colored bands on their legs. So um, this was great fun and uh, a huge challenge and was really the jumping off point for my interest in corvids and their behavior and their evolution. Um, I went on to get more interested in their behavior. And one of the things I studied was um, their social behavior, particularly uh, their group foraging behavior. So the photo you're seeing here is not of jays. These are actually um, babblers, the kind of bird we don't have in the US. But the kinds of experiments I was doing with the jays was kind of similar. We, we, we would present them with a lot of different um, sort of novel foraging areas in nature. And then I was observing which individual jays would do the work of finding food resources, and then which ones would kind of hang back on the side and then just take advantage of the information that had been gleaned to sort of rush in and um, steal the food. So this yeah. fits into kind of like a, a body of knowledge of foraging theory called producer scrounger theory. And um, it was pretty fun with the Jays because they had those color bands on their legs. We could start to know individual behavior. And there were definitely ones that produced the food. And there were definitely ones that kind of hung out and didn't do the work, but then just benefited from the knowledge. So this started to get me thinking about, you know, the intelligence of, of Corvids. And um, it was a really fun study. Uh, later on in my career, I sort of moved away from behavior and I started to get interested more in um, ecology and evolution. And this took me to a mountain range in Mexico called the Sierra del Carmen, where I was studying this same species called Mexican jays, but I was looking at how they are distributed on an elevation gradient in the mountain. And depending on what they're eating at the high elevation versus the low elevation, it was influencing the evolution and the shape of their bill size. So I spent many years traveling to this mountain range, um, trapping birds, taking measurements and photographs of their bill, um, putting colored bands on them and then re-releasing them to the wild and um, studying the, the shapes of their beaks in relation to their food resources. This is where I learned that one of the interesting things that Mexican jays do is that once you've sort of you're done with them and you're about to re-release them to the wild uh, you'll often open up your hand and they will just lie there looking at you and they won't go anywhere oh my gosh they're, they're not playing dead because they have their eyes open and you just have to kind of like walk them over to a branch almost physically put their feet on the branch and then slowly let them go and eventually they'll snap out of this little trance and, and fly away. And in fact, if you have them, if they're holding onto a pencil or something like that, you can even like slowly let them go and they'll just hang there from a pencil until suddenly they'll, they'll snap out of it. And fly. Is it a defense mechanism? Like, do you know why? I do not know why. I mean, that is kind of the theory that jumps to mind, right? It's almost like playing dead, but um, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense really from that perspective so the short answer is I don't know but <laughs> <laughs> so these days I'm more interested in the evolutionary history of birds and reconstructing sort of broad scale very deep time millions of years ago relationships of birds how species were formed what were the factors forming species and like how and when did it happen so now I'm creating these big evolutionary histories of all corvids in wow. the lab, mainly using DNA sequence data um, generated in a genomics lab. So things have got pretty technical and a, a pretty long ways away from me up in that tree in Arizona, but um, it is still a lot of fun and really rewarding work. 
So I want to start here, um, really at the basics, just saying, you know, what is a Corvid? We've been using this word, and it's in the title of the talk, but um, not always well known what that exactly means. Corvids are crows, ravens, jays, and some other birds um, that are closely related that are in a family of birds called the Corvidae. Um, this includes some well-known things, backyard birds like the scrub jay here on the left, ravens and crows, but also some lesser known things that are found over in Asia, like the green tree pie in the lower right. So there's 103, 133 species of corvids worldwide, and they are all known to be highly intelligent. Uh, well, as I said, I'm an evolutionary history buff, so I wanna tell you a little bit about the origins, the deep origins of corvids. Um, what I am showing you here in the upper right is actually a map of human evolution and dispersal out of Africa. You may know that humans evolved and then spread around the globe and reached North America maybe about 15,000 years ago through the Bering Land Bridge, kind of showing you up here in the upper right near North Asia there. Corvids actually um, sort of have a similar history uh, and dispersal, only it was a much longer time ago. So corvids evolved 15 million years ago in the areas that are now Australia and Southeast Asia. And then they moved also up through that same Bering Land Bridge, colonized into North America and then into South America uh, four, at least four different times. So um, we've got four lineages, separate lineage, at least four, five actually, separate lineage, lineages of corvids that are now in the Americas. Um, and I'm just showing you a few representatives of those lineages here. Um, Stellar's jay and scrub jay being part of those. Common raven and the crows being another. And then some interesting sort of one-off birds that you may not be that familiar with, um, things like Clark's nutcracker and mm. gray jay some of the high elevation birds of the American West. Uh, Corvid's closest relative, living relative on Earth, is a family of birds called the Shrikes, the Laniidae. Um, these are pretty cool birds, too. Uh, you can consider them almost like the brother-sister family to, to Corvid's. They are small songbirds, but they um, act almost like birds of prey and raptors. They have this hook at the end of their beak, and they're known for grabbing their prey, like a grasshopper or even a lizard or a mouse, killing it and then impaling it on a thorn or on barbed wire to save for later. So the picture pretty much. Is the pretty, picture pretty much sums it up. There were some more <laughs> gruesome pictures out there on the internet. I, I chose to go with this one that was a little more. Yeah, I'm sure we all appreciate palatable. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So corvids uh, appear all the time in literature and the movies and TV um, and seem to always be represented as um, a highly intelligent bird, whether it is the Hunger Games books by Susan Collins. You've got the Mockingjay. This was, uh, it's not a real bird, but it's a, a, a fictional hybrid between a corvid and a mockingbird that's able to mimic human sound and is highly intelligent. Um, all the way back to Edgar Allan Poe's famous poem, The Raven, where you have a, a, a corvid, a raven that can mimic human speech and sort of drives a person insane by constantly responding to him with the word, nevermore. Um, so always depicted as smart, probably to the point of scary smart, um, of course, probably the most famous representation of all is Alfred Hitchcock's horror film, The Birds, where uh, the corvids take on a very menacing aspect. So how did they get these smarts or uh, scary smarts and, and what exactly are their full capacities? I'm gonna take you through just a few of the areas um, of uh, corvid smarts to show you how clever they are. And the first one I wanna hit upon is problem solving. Corvids are known to be great problem solvers. Um, first, I wanna just talk a little bit, if I, you know, I, I'm a professor, so I gotta get a little pr professorial here and talk to you a little bit about our knowledge of avian cognition 
intelligence and how it's changed through time. What I'm showing you here on the top is sort of a classic uh, view from decades ago where uh, comparing the songbird brain up here on the left, upper left, to the human brain on the upper right. And you can see in the purple areas, these are parts of the brain that researchers assumed were for instinctive behaviors. And then the green is parts of the brain that was responsible for more complex cognitive behaviors. So it used to be that the parts of the avian brain that had been identified, most people thought that they were for instinct and not sort of higher processing. But the more we learn about the bird brain, the more we learn, uh, you know, there even is that term, right? Bird brained, <laughs> not very smart. But the more we learn about the bird brain, the more we learn that, that um, bird brain is actually quite a compliment. Because as you can see down here on the bottom, this is the modern view where the bird brain is now known to be responsible for uh, a lot of different complex behaviors instead of instinctual behaviors. Wow. And in fact, there are parts of the bird brain that are really um, doing similar things to the prefrontal cortex of primates, which is the part of the brain that's responsible for, for a lot of the complex thought. Um, and this is thought to be an independent evolutionary event in birds um, where this part of the brain has developed. So the more we learn about bird brains, the more we learn they are more like primate, more like human brains than we might have originally thought. And that allows birds to do lots of complex tasks. So there's all kinds of amazing studies that have been done, especially with a particular species called the New Caledonian crow. Mm -hmm. This crow, for whatever reason, seems to be smarter than all the other species. And... Um, uh, this particular experiment I'm showing you, uh, you can see the number one over here. What they do is they present these crows with almost like a toolkit composed of uh, thin rods with little connectors and ways to connect the rods together. And then they also present the bird with a box where um, essentially the bird can see that there's a piece of food inside, mm -hmm. but it can't reach its beak inside. It can only reach a little stick. And these new Caledonian crows have been shown to be able to look at the tools at hand, construct a long, thin rod out of the tools presented to us, the little bits and pieces, basically construct a tool, and then insert it in and move the food so source over to retrieve it. So How really amazing, you know, not just using tools, but actually constructing tools. How long does it take them to figure out how to get the food. Yeah, so they do a little bit of pre-training on these tasks. Um, usually they're kind of like taught on one piece of the task first that they learn how, and then eventually they're sort of novelly presented with all the pieces that they've sort of independently come to understand. And, you know, it only takes a little while for them to figure this out. So um, what I'm showing you here is a new Caledonian crow doing a different kind of task. Um, Uh, almost learning basically how to use a type of vending machine. Uh, so this is showing you that these crows actually do use tools in the wild, and this is why researchers first started studying them. Wow. And where are they native to? Yeah, so New Caledonia is, a, is an island basically off the coast of Australia. And um, so it's an endemic crow to that island. You know, whether existence on an island has made the conditions under which you have to be particularly smart, right? Kind of like Survivor. Uh, oh, yeah. That's Interesting. That's possible theory, right? So, yeah, they learn quickly that if they insert these little pieces of paper into a certain slot, they get a treat. <laughs> and, um, it's almost like they can form a mental template for um, the tools they need to make. Wow. And do they retain the information? So they'll like, can they go back over a period of time? Yeah, they will remember it over multiple trials. Um, here's another experiment. This is not with a uh, New Caledonian crow, but with a, a different type of crow that just has the common name, the rook. 
Arctis is a, a Northern European, like Siberian Palearctic species. And in this experiment, this is pretty wild because the rook was able to essentially understand that it could use rocks to displace water and move a water column up so that it could then retrieve a piece of food. Wow. And so they presented the rook with both a column that had the food in it, but was filled with sand and also one with water. And it essentially knew that you couldn't add the rocks to sand to have the same effect that you could have by adding it to water. I'm sure as, as a scientist and bird researcher, this is just like so exciting for your heart, you know, to watch. I'm oh, sure yeah. years of and, study. And also, you know, the scientist in me uh, just loves the complex experimental design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not really explaining that to you here, but all of these trials have sort of like negative controls, multiple individuals so that you can have a high sample size. You know, this is um, not based on just like one exceptional bird that's able to do something that, that no other birds can do. Although I will give you one example later where that is maybe the case. <laughs> <laughs> so that is complex tasks. Another thing that corvids do that's really incredible is that they have amazing memories. Um, I'm showing you here a picture of a Clark's nutcracker. This is a high elevation bird from the, uh, basically the American West high elevation pine forests. And it has uh, a very uh, tight association with pine trees and pine seeds. That's most of what it eats, especially in the winter months. And it has this long pointed bill that allows it to extract pine seeds from cones. And so studies have shown that these Clark's nutcrackers can remember up to 20,000 seed caching locations. So what they do is they go around to these different pine trees, they fill their crops with pine seeds. And you can see that in the illustration in the upper left here. And then once they've got a, a full pouch, throat pouch of pine seeds, they fly down to tons of different places and they bury a few seeds at a time and, and hide them. And they can remember these for months and months and months, up to, up to nine months in some cases although they have shown that their memory kind of starts to lag and they make more mistakes. The experiments that were done here were done um, not in the wild, but in controlled trials in labs, uh, like you're seeing here on the bottom left. And uh, they could still remember these locations after nine months, but they started to make more mistakes eventually. Wow. And to think, I forget what I had for breakfast yesterday. So this is very impressive. Right, exactly, right. <laughs> I can't keep track of my car keys. But... <laughs> Nutcracker. Yeah, maybe maybe we all need a pet nutcracker to find our keys. Mm -hmm. um, so the reasons behind this, um, I mean, I already mentioned that they, they um, are pretty specialized on pine seeds, but what I'm showing you here is kind of the, the breeding cycle of your average songbird. Oh, this isn't your average songbird, obviously, it's a very <laughs> beautiful one, the scarlet tanager, but it has what you might consider to be kind of a, a normal annual cycle. Uh, in the outer ring here, we have when they tend to migrate. So you can see it tends to be in the spring and fall, like we think of with normal migratory birds. Uh, the middle ring is when they tend to breed, which is in the summer months, June and July. And then in the middle is when they molt their feathers, which is essentially in between those two things. So birds tend to schedule all of their important life history events at different times to um, spread out the energy requirements. When you look at the cycle of a Clark's Nutcracker, however, you can see that um, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, it tends to, it does migrate, but the times are variable. Its breeding is spread out over many months and its molting could basically be any time of the year. And that's because it wanders around nomadically uh, wherever pine crops are um, starting to happen. And so its whole life cycle is just super tightly associated with pine seeds. If it can't remember where these pine seeds are, you know, it, it's not going to survive to the next season. So that's been one of the thoughts as to how this amazing spatial memory has come to be. Wow. It's truly a matter of life and death. 
so corvids have been really kind of models for understanding memory and understanding memory in birds, um, especially a particular type of memory called episodic memory. And you can kind of think of that as the what, when, and where that something happened. Um, people who study memory in a more research aspect talk about something called working memory. That's just sort of the memory we rely on in our day-to-day -day, uh, world. And that's divided into two tasks. One is called semantic memory. And that's like just all of our knowledge of the world, things we've read in books, things people have told us, mm. facts, you know, different places, things we hear on the news. And then there's another type of memory that's called episodic memory that is about specifically remembering events from the past that happened to us in kind of a chronological way. And so this type of memory is something that we know, of course, humans have it, but has not been shown in many other species. And for episodic memory to really um, happen in an organism, you sort of have to meet some requirements. You know, that, that species, that animal needs to have a subjective sense of time, right? Um, it needs to have some kind of knowledge of itself as, and, and itself as a, a sort of independent thing in time, something they call autonoetic consciousness. Kind of a, a beautiful word, right? Yeah. So um, this was actually demonstrated for, for the first time in animals in a corvid. In, in fact, our, our local Western scrub jay from research trials that were done in a lab. And here, uh, this is work that was done by, by Nicola Clayton, Nikki Clayton, who's shown in the, the, the bottom half of the slide there. Uh, she and her colleague, presented Western scrub jays with these ice cube trays filled with sand. And then they let them bury either seeds or grubs in these different parts of the ice cube tray. And so the thing about this experiment is that grubs would eventually rot and perish. And the uh, scrub jays liked the grubs more. They were more nutritious. And what they found in this experiment is that the Jays basically satisfied all of the factors required for episodic memory in that they knew the what, they knew that they were burying either grubs versus seeds, um, they knew the where, so they could remember exactly where in the tray they buried each one, and then they could also remember the when. So they would, this is kind of the special part of the experiment, they teased apart that the scrub Jays seemed to know that grubs would not only spoil, but when they would spoil, meaning they knew how long ago they had buried them because they would always dig them up first um, before they rotted. Wow. So yeah, satisfying all of the, the technical requirements, but because we still don't really have a knowledge for how the Western scrub jays sort of perceive themselves as individuals <laughs> in all this, right? We can't ask them. Um, they call this episodic like memory, um, you know, pending further study. So very, very cool. Um, you know, maybe you've also heard of this classic uh, mirror test that they sometimes give to animals yeah. to gauge whether they have self-awareness. Um, this is whether or not animals will recognize their reflection in a mirror as being themselves or they will think it is some kind of other animal, right? Sometimes you see these videos of cats who see themselves in the mirror and puff up because they think it's uh, another cat. Um, a lot of birds uh, will sit on um, car uh, side mirrors and see themselves and will aggressively peck <laughs> at themselves. Uh, and really the only animals up until now that have definitively passed the mirror test are things like primates, dolphins, and I think there's a case of, a, of an elephant having passed it. Wow. And then there is the Eurasian magpie. So this is a, a kind of corvid that's found in Europe. We do have a couple close relatives of this species um, in Western North America. But what they did in this experiment is kind of ingenious. They put little 
colored stickers you can see here on the throat of the bird that it could only see if it was in the mirror. Oh. And then they presented the bird with a mirror and it could see those stickers and it didn't want them on its throat. And so then it would try to like get them off by like craning its head down and seeing if it could peck the stickers away. So Meanwhile, it, they had, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask, so it knew, so by being aware that I had to take the stickers off, it knew that it was on itself. So it's like a recognition. Exactly. Gotcha, okay. And then they also had a control trial where they just put black stickers on the bird that it couldn't see in the mirror. And so, you know, it wasn't just the act of touching the throat or something that made it look, it was the actual seeing something weird in the mirror and knowing that it was itself. Wow. So this is really groundbreaking study um, of self-recognition. Another group since then, another research group has gone in and tried to replicate these results with European, uh, Eurasian magpies and um, couldn't find the same results. So this is a case where maybe this was just a, a special group of magpies that were, had achieved self-awareness. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's kind of like a little uncertainty on this research finding until we do some follow-up studies. Still breakthrough though, pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, very, very cool. You could at least uh, a few individuals. Um, this was an absolutely crazy study that was carried out in, um, in the Seattle area on American crows. So as part of a different study, they were catching crows and putting colored bands on their legs in a city park. And so they thought up an idea, an experiment they could carry out just in the process of doing that, that would see if crows could um, recognize the faces of individual humans. And so what they started doing was having people put on this kind of creepy mask yeah, it's every creepy. time that they would catch and ban the crows, which obviously the crow didn't like that. Yeah. It wasn't harmed during the process of it, but it didn't like it. And um, so then uh, every time anybody would show up in the park wearing that mask, the crows would just go crazy. They'd start cawing, they'd fly and swoop down and like kind of try to like attack or mob the individual. But if that person went away and like took the mask off and walked back through the park, um, even wearing like the same clothes, the crows wouldn't care at all. So they could really mm -hmm. like recognize either this mask or, or, or the, the, the actual facial features. I wonder if the mask was like more appealing if the results would be different, you know, like as a human don't want to hang out with that mask. So, you know. right. I, I think this study also had a control where they had a different kind of mask as well. Um, but, but, a a look on the mask that like is, um, was not the same mask as the people who ban mm -hmm. caught and banded and, and they didn't have the response to just the mask either. So oh, wow. it was not just you're weird because you're wearing a mask. It's like, you're weird because I can recognize you're the person that caught me and I don't like you. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I've actually experienced this, this effect myself in some of my research when I was in that mountain range in Mexico. Um, I would pull up, at that time I had a maroon Nissan Pathfinder and I'd pull up to the field side and I'd get out in my like customary orange cap and those Jays absolutely knew me. They were like, there's the guy that shows up every year to catch us and put bands on our legs and they would start chattering and flying around and they were definitely like not happy that I was back. <laughs> Whoa, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's kind of complex problem solving memory. Um, now I wanna talk to you a little bit about Corvid culture. So smart birds are able to start to develop something um, sort of approaching a culture, if you will. And um, in birds, this often takes place through something called cooperative breeding. So this is when um, non-parents will help to feed the young. So you'll just have extra individuals oh. that are around in a flock of birds that will assist the parents by going and getting food and bringing it to the nest. They'll defend the nest, they'll call if there's a snake nearby and warn of predators. Basically, they're just helpers at the nest. 
And um, of the 133 species of corvids, actually 33 of them are cooperative breeders, which is 20%, almost seven times as much as you find just in birds in general, where only 3% are cooperative breeders. So um, classic cooperative breeder, um, in addition to those Mexican jays I studied, are Florida scrub jays, um, which are found kind of in the middle of the, the Florida panhandle, actually an, an endangered bird now. Um, so uh, these social structures can get very complex. Um, the pinion jay, which is another species very dependent on pine seeds and sort of distributed around the same area that the Clark's nutcrackers are in the American West, they go around also in these huge nomadic flocks of hundreds of birds. And when they find a bunch of pine cones and pine seeds on the ground, they just blanket the ground. They're all calling, they're hopping over each other. They're like tripping over each <laughs> other, um, but seem to like not be getting that angry at each other, right? They're, they are evolved for sociality. <laughs> and what's so fun is that um, they breed all at the same time. And then the young, after they're hatched, sort of form these little groups called um, creches that are watched over by the adults, almost like a little form of preschool or something. People put their young into, into preschool so that all the adults don't have to be paying attention at all the time. Yeah, that sounds ideal. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. Exactly. That's the way to do it, right? <laughs> Um, so for cooperative breeding to sort of develop, um, the researchers who have studied this have identified some, some key traits that need to happen. Um, you have to have a strong social bond between parents and young, which is not always a given in birds. There are some birds that, um, like where the males, for instance, will really not contribute to the care of the young. Mm -hmm. um, and even some species where, where the females don't either. And the Baby bird basically hatches, it's fully capable of taking care of itself, and it wanders off into the world. Um, but for cooperative breeding, really, you need a different situation. You need a really strong social bond between parents and their young. And typically, you also have dis a delayed dispersal from the nesting site. So the young tend to hang around. They don't immediately fly off to kind of strike out and find their own territory. And then because of that, you really need tolerance of the adult birds to the grown young. So if there are any uh, parents in the audience with college age kids or recent college graduates, you know, you might be kind of dealing with some of this yourselves where the grown young has sort of decided to stay around the nest for a little while and uh, certain behaviors need to develop for, for tolerance. Right, mom. Birds. But Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, right, mom? I know she's watching. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah I did a little bit of that myself, too. <laughs> parents were, were very tolerant. Uh, birds have developed a slightly different way uh, to do it, and they actually have um, evolved something called delayed plumage or delayed uh, color maturation in young birds. Um, so what I'm showing you here on the right is a Mexican jay. Uh, like a first, a second, or third, even a third year bird uh, will not have a fully dark beak. It has a, it starts out with a very light color and then it slowly fills in with dark until like maybe it's third or fourth year. And then some corvids have even more complex uh, maturation phases where the young bird starts out um, in this Yucatan jay in the lower right wow. with a lot of white plumage and then it slowly the plumage gets dark and it but it's its bill and its eye rings stay light and then finally the adult bird has fleshed out into its fully dark black and blue plumage but the legs stay yellow and so is that to be able to differentiate between some of the younger birds and some of the older birds exactly so the thought is um that basically those light colors are signals oh. that the young birds are giving to say hey um I'm not trying to breed here. I'm not trying to like horn in on your territory and steal your mate. I'm just here to help uh, at the nest. And then um, you could ask, okay, well, that's cool. But what's in it for those birds in the long run? Uh, essentially, they're taking a waiting strategy where they're, you know, waiting for predation or old age basically to free up 
uh, a territory so that it can then take its place. So it's kind of a, a get in line sort of social behavior. I was thinking like a mentorship program. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Like wow. Yeah, there you go. Apprenticeship probably yeah. <laughs> makes more sense. And then a final aspect of Corvid behavior that is really wild is that a lot of them seem to have something that you might describe if we want to get a bit anthropomorphic about it and, and sort of ascribe human behaviors to, to animals, you might call a form of funeral. So this is a, a study that was done on Western scrub jays. And I've actually seen this behavior myself in the wild. One time I was walking down a canyon in, in the same mountain range in Mexico where I heard a commotion in the canyon, Mexican jays calling from all sides. I assumed there was a snake or some kind of predator, maybe an owl. And I walked up and there in the middle of the sandy wash, underneath a rock ledge was a pristine recently died Mexican jay. And all of the other birds were basically all around it, sort of squawking. And what to me at the time seemed like, you know, some kind of a social ritual. And this was before wow. this paper came out in 2012, kind of showing that this was a thing that some corvids seem to do. So um, what they're getting out of this is kind of unclear, but they do seem to recognize they're recently fallen and have some sort of group reaction to it. That's so cool. So then when you read the paper, you're like, I've experienced that. Yeah, I've exactly. Was, <laughs> you know, this was in probably like, you know, early 2000s, sort of before we had phones and our cameras and everything else. God, I wish that I had, you know, yeah. had the wherewithal to, to document it because it was just so interesting. And clearly like this had just happened. It sort of stumbled upon the wake. Uh, so the last thing I want to tell you about, just really briefly, because it's so fun, is the idea of play in corvids. So play is found in a lot of different animals. Um, I think even all the way down to insects, some wasps have even been shown to engage in things that we might describe as play. And there's a lot of theories behind why animals play. Um, say, some say it's for training and to gain sort of strength and skills that you might use um, when you're older. Um, some say that it's to develop what's called an attention getting uh, type of, of behavior where you become, uh, you know, an individual that's able to capture the attention of other individuals in your group. Um, but there's some cases where, you know, and, and this is the really interesting ones because it really doesn't have any kind of adaptive explanation. Maybe the bird or animal is just having fun. And uh, so there's some cases of play in corvids. Um, I'm showing you one here between a couple of ravens playing in the snow. Super fun to watch. You know, they're almost like puppies that are playing around. And here you could really see, okay, like they're clearly having fun, it seems like. But you could also see this being kind of useful for honing <laughs> behaviors and gaining skills for young birds. Super cute to watch. It is around. so cute. <laughs> yeah. But then there are some other videos that just it really seem like this next one here, that the Corvid is just having fun. I mean, it is just doing this. This is not an injured bird. It kind of looks like he's flapping around like he's injured. <laughs> he's just rolling down a hill in the snow, you know, like a kid. It's so endearing. It really is. And, um, you know, it's a window into that cognitive side of birds that really <laughs> remains to be explored. What are they thinking when they're doing this? So just to kind of summarize here as I wrap up, um, corvids have well-developed brains that allow amazing spatial memory, episodic-like remembrances, facial recognition, complex social groups, and play. But we're still very much learning what parts 
of the corvid brain are responsible for all this, how corvid brains are different from other bird brains and other smart birds like parrots that allow them to have some of these special behaviors. And um, not only what parts of the brain, but also what parts of the genome and the DNA have allowed that to evolve and develop. So still plenty more to learn, um, plenty more to explore and understand from the scientific side. But in the meantime, I hope this gives you a new window on corvid brains and corvid personalities for the next time maybe you set out that tray of peanuts for your <laughs> local scrub jay. What are they thinking? So yeah. thank you so much for listening. This has been really fun. Um, at the Moore Lab, you know, we have a, a, a research program going on. We often have outreach events. If you'd like to hop on our mailing list, you can do that by visiting our website at moorelab.oxy.edu. Again, a good place to jump in um, to our research is on our Instagram at MLC Birds. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email uh, at mccormick at oxy.edu. Uh, at Occidental College and in the Moore Lab, we really have a um, very active these days, uh, ornithology and museum science program involving that Mexican bird collection that was mentioned, uh, a genomic center, an ancient DNA lab, all part of this big Anderson Center of Environmental Science. Um, our students are doing great work. They're getting great fellowships. And so if you have a bird nerd young person in your life <laughs> who is thinking about college, um, go ahead and, and send them our way. Thank you so much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. That was awesome. I and all of the attendees are clapping for you virtually. <laughs> but yes, there's actually a ton of questions that came in. So if you didn't get a chance to ask it, go ahead and start posting that in the chat. I'm going to pull up some of them right now. Um, but that was awesome. Thank you so much. All right, let's, let's start with some questions. So we have, oh, Heather asked, what is a good visual cue to determine whether it is a crow or a raven? Ooh, good question. Good one. Especially here in Los Angeles and Southern California where you can have both crows and ravens. So this is where museum specimens do come in handy because if you put a crow and a raven next to each other, ravens are absolutely huge compared to crows. The problem is when you're seeing them out there in nature, um, you don't always have a size reference for scale. And so I think one of the best uh, visual cues is the size of the beak compared to the overall size of the head. Ravens just have absolutely huge beaks. That is like, you know, the beak is almost like half the size of the total head. Um, whereas a crow has a much smaller beak with kind of uh, fewer nasal tufts sticking up. Um, the sound is also pretty distinctive. So ravens have kind of a very deep sort of croak and um, crows do sort of more of the high pitched caw, caw, caw thing. And um, then the tail in flight is sometimes discussed as a, a key feature. So crows tend to have more of like a, almost like a squared off rectangular type tail. Whereas in flight, the raven tail is gonna kind of look more diamond shaped and gradate, like have a gradation at the end. I haven't found that like a lot of times you see a tail in flight and you're still like, mm, I didn't really <laughs> catch that. So it can be tough, no matter what kind of a look you get at the bird. Yeah, but practice makes perfect. Practice okay. makes not always perfect, but it can definitely help. There you go. You're right. Thank you for being more real <laughs> with the audience. <laughs> um, oh, let's see. Okay. Melissa asked, what is the best food to feed our two resident crows? Ooh, crows. Yeah. Um, well, crows will, they're omnivores, so they will eat almost anything. But, um, you know, I think any type of, of seed, large seed, I would say, um, that you would give the same kind of things that you would give to a jay um, would be good for crows or for ravens. But they will also eat you know, just about anything they can get their beaks on. <laughs> Good point. All right. Another one was, oh, what are you doing in the picture with all of the yellow birds lined up? 
I mean, this is a similar picture that's on the screen right now. Yeah, so that that's in the bird collection. So those that's the the specimen collection. So those were birds that are in, in the Moore Lab specimen collection. Um, they were collected long ago, uh, 1933 to 1955 is when wow. most of the collections were made. And so what we do with those specimens now is kind of um, uh, make good use of those birds that were kind of donated for science. And we measure them and we can actually get DNA out of those specimens. And the stuff we learn from those studies help us have more knowledge about birds and kind of directly lead into um, conservation efforts as well. So I know it's a little hard to think about conservation when you're looking at a tray of dead birds, but um, <laughs> really um, what we can learn from those specimens collected a long time ago is extraordinarily helpful to the populations that are alive today. And speaking more about learning, can you recommend a book on the birds of Mexico? Ooh, uh, yeah, a book on the birds of Mexico. Well, um, in terms of a field guide, uh, Steve Howell, Birds of Mexico in Central America, uh, is really still kind of the, the, the gold standard. Um, I think he's working on a second edition. It's, it's pretty, pretty old by now. It's, it's a thick book, um, but it's got all the birds and their ranges and um, plates showing pictures of them. Yeah. Howell and Webb. Sophie Webb is the artist who did the illustration. Steve Howell did the text. Cool. All right, Joyce, I hope you wrote that down. <laughs> um, Terry asks, I read about, I read often that ravens are generally seen in pairs and not groups. More times I see them in large groups. So why is it said that they travel in pairs? Yeah, because they will travel in pairs during the breeding season. And mm -hmm. they uh, also are more likely to be found in smaller groups even uh, during the winter season. So they do sometimes roost together and they hang out at night in, in larger groups uh, during, the, during the winter months. But um, crows are really the ones that will gather in really, really, really large flocks. Interesting. Yeah, so that, that's sometimes another way that I will clue into maybe a raven is if you see them flying or circling in a pair, especially a couple birds circling high above overhead those are almost always going to be ravens and not crows. Hmm. All right. Let's see. Russell says, hi, John. What do you think about, what do you think attributed more to the evolution of intelligence in corvids, the ad advantages of social behavior or the needs to develop problem solving skills? It's a good one. It is a really good one. And I am going to punt on that one by just saying, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, clearly there is something in the early evolution, because this is not just corvids that got to the Americas. Um, the New Caledonian crow that's off the coast of Australia, it's the rook that's in Siberia. Something happened in that early history 15 million years ago that led to the development of intelligence. And maybe when we dive into the genome and start to understand the DNA triggers, and when they developed, um, we might get a window on the why. Um, mm -hmm. Until then, uh, I think we just kind of have to speculate, yeah, which is super fun. But um, maybe the answers will come with time. I don't know. That's a good title of a research paper. When you find the answers, the window to the why. Just, there you go. You can say that was coined here. Hmm. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Deb asks, I once saw two ravens or crows attacking a pigeon. They both had each wing pinned down to the ground and were pecking at it. Is this normal behavior? Um, I don't know that I would say that that's normal behavior in the sense that you probably don't see it every day. But uh, corvids also have a sort of reputation for being, uh, you know, kind of uh, nasty birds sometimes who what? will steal the young uh, out of the nest of other species. They'll steal and eat the eggs of other species. And um, if they can find a way to make a meal out of a helpless bird, they, they probably will. So that's the, the, the sneaky side of those clever corvids. 
No, I think that's a fantastic answer. And we have resources on chirperbirds.com that you can look on how to help the declining bird populations, how to take care of your cats, talking about the window collisions too. So that was a good segue um, into how you can better your bird brain and also just continue to raise awareness and consciousness because wild birds are awesome and they deserve to be supported and cared for. But first off, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. McCormack. It was such a pleasure getting to learn from you and see ravens rolling in snow. So post it if you learned something new. I'm so grateful and I really look forward to being able to collaborate with you and the lab in the future as well. Thank you so much. It was great. Until then, let us know how we can help. We are located at 578 Bonanza Trail in Big Bear Lake, California. We have our phone number right there. You can email us anytime at help at chirpforbirds.com. You can also go to chirpforbirds.com for wild bird resources, for shopping online, for activities. Basically, all the ways to have a good time with wild birds. So until we see you again, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Don't forget to go to chirpforbirds.com slash quiz. Take that quick quiz and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Happy birding.